Uh, today, um, I'm going to be your guest host or substitute teacher so everyone can start doing all sorts of crazy stuff in the back of the classroom like we all did when uh, substitute teachers would show up in our in our schools. But anyway, we are going to be here at the CU Digital Town Hall. I think it's number 36. My gosh, time flies when you're having fun. I can't believe there's 36 of these out there. And uh, each one has just been so tremendous in itself. So we thank you guys for hanging with us for all these uh, weeks and contributing and participating, which we're hoping that you guys will uh, participate as well today because we have, again, Mr. Glenn Servati from 154 Advisors. Glenn, how you doing, sir? I'm great here in Atlanta. Good, good. And before we get started, we want to say a special thanks to today's sponsors. And number one, uh, we have the CUNA Councils. Uh, they do a great job, obviously, with all their, uh, their all their conferences and getting people together to talk about not only like HR, lending, marketing, new business, technology, the whole, it, the whole works. It runs the gamut with the CUNA Council. So thank you very much for CUNA Councils for sponsoring these shows. And we also have the fine folks at MemberPass, who, by the way, they are really taking, I don't know if you've heard, Glenn, but um, MemberPass, their whole digital ID technology solution is just taking off now. Lots of credit unions are like hopping on board there. So congrats to uh, the folks at MemberPass. Just saw they won an advance award down here in Atlanta in our FinTech South event uh, just this last week. I oh, really? Yes, sir. Uh, accept that. Yes. Right on. Right on. Yeah. So great, great job those guys are doing. So appreciate uh, their support as well. And obviously this is put on. Hi, Rock. It's Lisa Brass with Trust Federal Credit Union. How are you? We're good. Can we mute everyone, please? <laughs> All right, and, and just to finish up our sponsors, we have uh, the fine folks at Best Innovation Group, uh, John Best and his crew who started this, uh, who started the CU Digital Town Hall 36 weeks ago. And uh, just can be, uh, I mean, it's just a, a really great forum for folks to come on here and get some great information and to participate as well. And then we also have uh, CU Broadcast, that's an interesting uh, online interview show that uh, we enjoy doing uh, for the past, our, we're celebrating, next month will be our decade celebration. We've been doing that oh for gosh. 10 years. 10 years, can you believe it? Holy do smokes. You, do you have a count of how many interviews that's been over 10 years? I, I know you have the numeric counter on things. 4,200 and something interviews. Wow. <laughs> so wow. We've talked to a lot of people over the years, so, but it's been such a blast, it's so much fun. I don't even, I don't even call it work. It's so much fun. So, so we thank uh, everyone who has been on that show on that show as well. So, but let's get to this show, Glenn, cause we have, I mean, time's going to fly here for sure. And uh, there's a, uh, we say a big welcome. John Best obviously is the host and he is, uh, he got pulled away this afternoon uh, for this afternoon show. So I'm um, filling in again on the substitute teacher today, Mike Lawson's creator, host of CU Broadcast, and our fine guest, 154 Advisors, Glenn Sarvati. Glenn, thank you so much for joining us today. Appreciate it. Sure, sure. Always, in, always enjoy these conversations, and I hope it will be uh, highly interactive. I think it will be. Yeah. So yeah, I, I want to put that up front too. If any of you guys, any folks out there who want to chime in uh, during uh, Glenn's and my conversation, please feel free. And we're going to, we're going to toss it out to you guys as well. Uh, and we're going to be talking today about operating assumptions and the great 2021 budget challenge. So a lot of folks obviously right now are going through, it's, it's budget season basically. And uh, if they're, if you haven't started getting started, you're in the middle of it, or you may have finished up, who knows what, what stage you are at it. But Glenn, you, you wrote an interesting blog post a few weeks ago that with the same title, Operating Assumptions and the Great 2021 Budget Challenge. So, so let's ask the obvious question first here. What makes 2021 budget planning so unique and challenging this fall for credit unions? So I'm going to put that out there right now. Yeah. Well, this kind of sprouted out of a conversation that John Best and I were having a few weeks ago. I think it actually started on the whole kind of concept of working from home, which is just one of the many things that we have to kind of sort through in terms of how we're going to assume how long that continues and what it means to the organization overall. Right. And then we, we, I forget, John said something that was kind of like, you know what, this is usually the time of year. This was probably a conversation that took place in early September when this is the time of year that people are usually digging in, sharpening the pencil and dealing with their budgets. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a requirement. You need to do it from a compliance standpoint. You need to do it to just have a reasonable roadmap to figure out how you're going to, you know, you can't, you can't improve something if you don't measure it, as people say. Um, so you've got to have a benchmark out there of what you're actually aiming for. The challenge this year is, you know, you've got to have some idea of what it is you're going to face. I mean, even, this is almost impossible to even think about now. Imagine we didn't have COVID. 
you'd have the, and, and I actually did a blog post on this separately as well and for another venue, um, you know, the impacts of the election. That would be a pretty big wild card already when you think about what, you know, and not just, you know, choosing a president, but choosing the governing party at the top of the house. And then, you know, think about what happened and then you throw a, you know, a, a pandemic and the financial uh, you know, upheaval, upheaval that comes with that, you know, how people address that. You know, that's when we, there was a, the last time we had a major financial crisis and we had a change in administrations, that's when Dodd-Frank and the Durbin Amendment mm -hmm. and these types of things happened. Would we have done something differently or we, I, I'm almost positive we would have done something even if the Democrats hadn't taken control of the, uh, the Congress and Senate back in 2009 but it probably would have looked somewhat different. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing right out of the gate that we don't know about. Right. Then you throw all this other stuff on top of it. What's the unemployment rate going to look like? What's the delinquency rate going to look like? Are we actually going to be able to reopen our branches? How are you actually going to deal with your workforce? Are you going to have to worry about the workforce having significant downtime because there's a second wave come the, the winter? The, the challenge that really comes up is having a common set of assumptions that everybody's kind of pulling in the same direction because mm -hmm. it just doesn't make a lot of sense to, for every department to put together a budget. The thing I always think about is, okay, I, you know, I'm the sales department and I'm going to assume that uh, I'm going to sell you know, 57 copies of this great new widget that's going to come out sometime in, in the year. And then later on, someone says, but we're not putting that product out until November. So right. there, there goes your time to actually. So you better be aligned in terms of what you're assuming as mm -hmm. you're putting this budget together. So you can't mm -hmm. build them in a vacuum in several different functional areas across the organization. Right. And there's just so much. There's still so much uncertainty out there and, and trying to put up, come up with a plan for that. I mean, what do you have any suggestions for kind of a, a practical approach to this? Or do we just deal with the assumptions right now? Well, the, what, what John and I were talking about when we first had this conversation, I mentioned a company and it was not a financial services company, but I think the, uh, you know, the basic premise still applies. And it was a company that was kind of run by statisticians and engineers. So they were very detail oriented. So I, I, you know, I think they might've taken a, a much more fine tuned approach than might, might apply, particularly for FinTech companies, younger ones. But I think you know, some version of it still makes a ton of sense. They put together a document called operating assumptions. Mm -hmm. I mean, in theory, it always existed, but it became particularly important that everybody was totally aligned on it come budget season so that everybody was working off that same set of assumptions. But any new IT projects that were going to happen, any new product introductions, any significant meaningful level of hiring that was going to change. I mean, it was all baked into this living, breathing document that mm -hmm. ran, oh gee, I think it was, it was based on kind of project level and it probably ran a good 30, 40 pages, which again, you know, probably the vast majority of it, you know, typical 80, 20 rule, unless you were really down in the weeds of dealing with some stuff, most people probably didn't have to get to the, I mean, there were probably a very small handful of folks for whom each one of these things was important. Right. But there's probably the top, you know, five, six, seven initiatives that really wind up being important to everybody. Like, you know, first thing that comes to mind, you know, for something like the environment we're in is what are the, what's the interest rate environment gonna look like? What does the, you know, the delinquency rate look like? Mm -hmm. What are we assuming in terms of how we're doing our branch staffing? You know, basic, and the flip side to that, if we're not staffing our branches, how are we making sure that we've got the proper infrastructure in place to deal with work from home environment that people yeah. can connect properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there was a mad dash when all this began was was getting people to work from home remotely, not only safely but securely as well. So there's that whole thing as well. And this is sounds like this is going to be a continuing trend. And I'm also thinking about just taking it to like the technology side of things because we all a lot of most credit unions out there there was this also another mad dash to up the ante with their digital offerings as well. And if you're not there yet, I'm assuming that uh, that's in the plans as well for 2021, right? Is that kind of what uh, you're thinking as well too, Glenn? Yeah, and again, that would be one of the, in terms of a true initiative, that's not just an environmental factor that you have to have a common assumption on. I think that is one, I think you hit the nail on the head that every credit union ought to have in there because if you've already made the leap and have pretty well built out your digital platform and you know, your digital offerings, you're still going to need to be revising it and make sure it stays up to snuff. You're going to have to make sure it's battle tested because it's going to get more use going forward. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't gotten as far along, 
that's one that I think we can all agree you better be working for forward in terms of moving into a you know a situation where you can really offer those uh, those solutions online because even you know let's let's take out the rosiest scenario we've got a vaccine people get more comfortable and things get back to normal I think we can all safely assume we're not going back to where we were. We may have some slight regression in terms of people kind of taking back some of their old patterns and habits, but we've moved the meter forward permanently in terms of the digital uh, progression. I think I don't think there's any dispute about that. Yeah, and that needle was moved pretty far forward pretty quickly as well. So try planning for that. I mean, because I mean, I'm, I want to take it back to like even 2019 when people were planning for 2020, you know, 2020. I mean, who would have, obviously who would have imagined this would have happened? So, I mean, that just threw everything into a funk. And now you're trying to come around to 2020 and planning for 2021. And now you're trying to kind of right the ship a little bit, it seems like as well. It's like, all right, this year was just this discombobulation. We're all upside down. Now we're, we're really going to have to kind of right the ship a little bit and uh, get things back to a semi-normal as we can process. So, and I'm, I'm, I want to throw out the question out to the audience as well. If anybody has has any feedback on this as well. I'm sure you'd love to hear this too, Glenn. It's like, what, I mean, you, if you wanna- Yeah, I'd, I'd be curious, very, in hurdles. particular, did you, did you approach the budget process any differently this year? Did you purposely, one thing that comes to my mind, did you intentionally start it a bit later to make sure that yeah. you had more up-to-date assumptions? Because I can think of several times, you know, everybody wants to get a good start because it takes so long and takes up so much time. Yeah. You start it in August, in a fast moving world, I mean, if you start getting things together by April or by October, you know, by February, you might already be going, gee, this doesn't really reflect where we're at in the marketplace today. So, I mean, I think again, probably more than ever, that's definitely true this year. So I'm curious how people have approached that. Yeah, I would love to. anybody want to chime in, uh, Melissa or Andrew or anybody who wants to uh, chime in for just what, what hurdles or what experiences you guys are having with, uh, with your budgeting process this year, even from a technology standpoint or an operation standpoint, anybody want to chime in? I would love to hear what you guys are doing and that would be helpful to the rest of the group as well. So anybody want to want to chime in? That would be awesome. As we hear crickets. <laughs> it's all extremely confidential, sensitive information. I guess. All right. Well, we'll leave it at that. But if you guys want to chime in, that would be great. I mean, again, it would be super helpful. Maybe there's some people that are stuck out there. Andrew, it looks like Andrew's going to chime in. Well, I'll just say, I mean, not to get too much specifics, but we did have our strategic planning last week. And, you know, and primarily the things that we're trying to do is, you know, with the interest rate, uh, with the margins being so slim, you know, with the uh, projected losses possibly coming through, we don't know what's going to happen with the uh, real estate market it hasn't really even caught up because everybody's just been pushed down the forbearance and things like that. So it's really tough. So everything that we've been doing is like, what can we do as a lever like that will uh, get the most amount of like member experience or mem help, helping our members out with the technology and stuff with like the least amount of spend, you know, at this point. So that is one thing that we're looking at, kind of optimizing what we have. At the same time, what technologies do we need to bring in or additional items to bring in with the budget budgetary concerns that will, you know, like I said, that we can use that as a lever to get even more into the market and things that we need to accomplish. When you mentioned, you, you started by using the phrase strategic planning, Andrew, I'm curious, how do you define, what's the time horizon on that? Uh, it's always, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at one to two years, looking at three to five years. Okay. Because so. that's the other thing is, you know, it's so hard to even forecast a year right now, much less two to three. I mean, you always want to be thinking about it, but you, you have to definitely have the uh, the mindset that it's going to have to be course corrected. There's no question. And I will say, I mean, this was definitely one of the most engaging and uh, interesting strategic planning sessions to go through. I bet. Because previously, you can forecast out two to three years and you're you, you know what's going to happen, you know, mm -hmm. within reason. Uh, with now, it's like we're trying to forecast next two to three years. We don't even know what next year is going to look like. Yeah. So, yeah. Or much the end of this year. It's gonna yeah, look exactly. Like I was going to say much less next week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you work on a calendar based fiscal year? I mean, are you, when do you kind of lock down your budget for 2021? Yeah, we, we're, we're January to January. Yeah, so we're calendar based. Uh, so this is right now, like I'm just completing my budget. I'm actually a little bit late on it, but just completing my budgetary stuff right now. So I don't know if anybody and Mike, you and I talked about this a bit before we started. I have not seen a company do this for some time, but that same firm that I referred to had stopped doing this by the time I joined. But they used to take an approach where they would budget in just four month increments. 
which on one level is an incredible amount of work to have to do it every four months. And they yeah. can drive people crazy. On the other hand, you can actually work within a time horizon that, you know, you're probably really taking the most recent stuff and just adding a couple more months to the end of it, as opposed to kind of reinventing things because it hasn't gotten so out of date that you're starting from scratch again. So it's, it's an interesting idea. And I don't know that it makes a ton of sense for anybody to try, but given the lack of clarity for, you know, beyond the tips of our noses, this, this would be a time where I could see something like that making sense as well. What would that look like? I'm sorry, go ahead, Andrew. No, I was just going to say, you know, uh, back in March, it's basically what we had to do (laughs) kind of, okay, throw the old budget out the window. What are we going to do now? So (laughs) yeah, kind of be more agile. I kind of like that idea, Glenn, but at the same time, you know, I got to talk to the tech steering committee. I, you know, talked to all all the department heads and what they want to do, what we, you know, have that meeting to kind of, that, I wouldn't want to do that every four months. That's a lot right. of work. Yeah. Right. Could there be like a hybrid approach though, to where you have some sort of long-term plan than with a short-term, with a short, with the every four months or whatever? I mean, I think the, the, the challenge with that is it's difficult. It would be very difficult to literally start with a clean sheet of paper every four months, because again, I'm thinking about it from the other side. If I'm running a, a functional organization, you know, my projects that I'm taking on can't be stopped and started in four month increments. So once I get something going, I can't worry about somebody saying, yeah, you don't get funding for it next time. Sorry, stop. So I mean, it's got to have some kind of a run rate kind of approach, which again says that maybe you can do that for a while, but Mm -hmm. you've always got to go back to some type of a a clean sheet of paper, zero-based approach, whatever you want to call it, at least every two years, I'd say, Mm -hmm. at the longest. Mm -hmm. Got it. And and can you talk a bit more about operating assumptions and then how how that can keep departments in sync because this is so important right now especially with so again so much uncertainty out there but you got to have everybody kind of aligned or on the same page so how do these operating assumptions keep everyone in sync well i'm thinking again and you know you know we're all on zoom right now which is great but to the extent that you know whether this is is true or not i don't know if you're not running into people in the hallway, and even then you're not sure you're gonna hit them every time, right. the, you know, the ability for people to think that folks know something and you, you assume everybody's thinking about things the way you are, but it just isn't the case, is a real challenge. And you know, with decentralized organizations and the IT shop in one corner and the product group in another corner and the sales group, potentially, you know, the best of circumstances in a different building, uh, you know, or a different, you know, a different floor, but mm-hmm. now literally often like, you know, in a different suburb and not really having that many reasons to speak at all, right. you can start to assume that everybody's assuming the same thing that you are. And again, as I said, as I said before, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense for the salespeople to be projecting sales on a product that either IT doesn't have the resources planned to implement or the product development team doesn't actually have a plan to have completed by then. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm going to mute myself for one second because I think I'm going to need to cough. Okay, no, no worries, no worries. I was going to say that, I mean, and Andrew kind of alluded to it as well. It's like, I can imagine how these budgetary planning meetings, there's a, a heightened sense of, I don't want to say urgency, but they're just, they just seem to be, and I don't want to, I don't want to lessen their importance in the previous years, but it just seems so more important this year than others. It seems maybe people are just way more tuned in because of what has happened and what they don't know is going to happen. So, are you getting that feeling as well too, Glenn, that uh, there just seems think, to be? Yeah, I think, well, you make a good point. It's like it, when things are kind of, you know, same old, same old to the extent that they ever are these days, you know, it's a lot easier to assume that everybody's thinking about things the way you are. Right now, everything is so uncertain that I think there's a much more of a realization that, gee, I'm not really sure. <laughs> what I think is going to happen. So I certainly am not going to assume that, you know, the person in the next functional area is thinking about it the same way. So there's probably just more of a realization that these conversations need to take place. They always do, but I think people are probably a little bit more aware of it right now. Yeah, yeah. And, and not and lulled into a false sense of security. Here's the $64,000 question here. Are there any, I mean, are there a few 2021 assumptions most credit unions can safely make? Is there anything that's, <laughs> I know, I don't know if there's anything, but I know, I'm asking you this. Is, well, is, we talked before safe? about, I do think that everybody ought to be, nobody should be shortchanging their digital solutions. First, you know, full stop. I mean, I think that, you know, if you need to be making sure that you've got that piece covered, that yeah. you're, you're moving forward with those types of solutions. 
Unfortunately, on the other side, I think there's very little reason to believe that our interest rate environment is going to improve, you know, and at the, in the best of scenarios, maybe at the latter part of next year. And based on what we're hearing, even that's unlikely. So as far as interest rate going up? Uh, yeah. And, and in terms of net, net interest margins becoming less squeezed. Oh, yeah, you're right. So that's, you're right. that's the piece that I'm, you know, what, regardless of where they are in an absolute sense, it's the net interest margin that I'm really concerned about. Yeah. Um, those are, and, and that, that's one that is, you know, because that becomes so much of the, uh, the driving factor of, you know, where, you know, where a lot of the income comes from, um, you know, that if that's going to continue to be constrained, that you know, puts a crimp on your ability to spend, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But I think that's one that for better or worse, I think you better at least be planning for it. Yeah. Get some creativity in there. Actually, Paul Apodaca, do you want to come in, chime in and, and give us your experience as well, Paul? Uh, about uh, some of your budgetary planning meetings, or he's just going to stare us down with that. Avenue. <laughs> I just, well, he just uh, chatted with me privately that hey, he's willing to chime in about this as if if he's asked. But anytime you're ready, Paul, just chime in. But uh, yeah, this is a, a you know obviously a super timely, timely, to timely topic here. So has there? I want to talk about the the partial year budget approach too. I mean that you that you brought up. Um, has there ever been a time when a partial year budget approach can make sense? You know, and and is twenty twenty one it? And if I can't so, what? think of a better. I mean, I would think that the best times to do something like that are in times of uncertainty, and I can't think of a more uncertain time. Yeah, at least that we've been aware of at the time that a budget process was taking place. Right. I mean, if you assume that most people are on calendar year budgets, you know, and usually, you know, you might have been able to say the same thing when things really went haywire kind of in the, the summer months of 2008, you know, with the last global financial crisis, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because I don't think anybody had a really good sense. And guess what? We had the same thing where it was an election right. year as well. So, you know, you probably could have made that same argument. But that's, that's probably the last one I would point to. The other one, and I've, actually, I've got some other information that might be worth sharing. I don't know how directly relevant it is, at least from a branch standpoint, but I was talking to some colleagues in the, the real estate business, and they had done some research. I mean, I think some people have kind of seen this. A lot of the companies that had earlier been assuming that the return to the workplace might have been kind of in the January 2021 timeframe are now pushing that out to June, July next year. Mm -hmm. um, I've already seen a couple of the 2021 uh, early year uh, industry conferences and events have gone virtual already. CUNA GAC has already gone virtual for February. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, I think we are seeing kind of the elongated approach. So, and then even after that's over, the question is, you know, is anybody really believe we're going to go just like, you know, push a button and everybody's just going to file back into the workplace? Probably not. We especially given, again, for better or worse, that we've kind of proven, and particularly with some functional areas that we always believed there was no way they could be done from home. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, mm -hmm. we've proved pretty well they can be done from home. So one of the things I heard from the real estate people is they're finding that most of the deals that they're doing recently have about a 15 to 25% reduction in square footage. So there's kind of an implicit well, maybe not an implicit assumption that less people are coming back. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that had been happening over the course of the last 20, 25 years or so, because of the way people have been working with open floor plans and kind of, you know, yeah. groups that are kind of potted together, yep. the average square foot per employee per FTE in an, in an office space has tended to be going down over time. So, you know, it may not be as much that you don't expect everybody to come back, but it may that you, uh, but, but it may be that you're actually dealing with the situation now where you're going to have to space those people out even further. So, a twenty percent reduction in floor space may not mean a twenty percent reduction in the number of people in the building on a given day. It may be a thirty-five percent reduction because those people have to be spread out more freely as well. That's what I was thinking too, because uh, you know, because we're all talking about how commercial real estate. Oh my gosh, you know, I mean, all these corporations, you know, they're finding that the remote workplace works for the most part, and I'm, I'm sure there's some instances where it doesn't. 
but in this, in, you know, in, in most instances, it has worked and they're discovering this, but, and I've always thought, oh my gosh, what's going to happen with all this office space. But then you go around, then you kind of go back to what you were talking about, Glenn. It's like when some of those people do come back, they're going to have to be spaced out appropriately. So that's where that extra office space is probably going to be utilized with spacing the people out properly. And, and obviously you're going to have to budget for that as well. So and from a business plan standpoint, I mean, if you have less people, if you can, you make it make sense at the current prices, it may still right. drive down the rents. Right. Uh, that was one of the other things that uh, my friends in this, uh, it's a company called Cressa, C-R-E-S-A, that did this research. I can mm -hmm. see if it's available. I think they've got it on their website. You know, their understanding from the conversations they've been having is there's going to be very few companies that go back 100%. But on the other hand, there's going to be very few companies that stay 100% remote. So, you know, and like you know, the, the two extremes are just probably not realistic. It's just a matter of where you decide to fall in the middle of that balance. Right. And again, the, the, the conversation I was having with them had to do with kind of technical cap technological capabilities that we've had to work so hard just to kind of get things moving so we could keep the, you know, the, the wheels on the, on the moving car mm -hmm. and keep the, the, the business operating right now. Now that we've seen that we've done that and we're kind of seeing that that's going to be a necessary piece of the business for the long haul, now it's probably time to start moving into the optimization stage. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're going to have people working from home, maybe not all of them, but you're still going to do it. So you better make sure you've got the, the technology backbone to make that work effectively. Yeah. From an operating assumption standpoint, that might be another one. You might not know exactly when people are going to go back in the office but you probably know that you're gonna to have to continue to support them on a remote basis. So if you're doing it kind of on a bailing wire kind of basis right now, you know, might as well start hunkering down for the long haul because you know that infrastructure is gonna be needed. Right, exactly. Oh gosh, you just took the thought right out of my brain because I'm thinking, because when people had that mad dash to work remotely in the beginning, it's like, okay, let's, let's put all this stuff together real quickly, but now's the time to kind of really budget for it and, and put something together appropriate or you know, some appropriate, you know, technology to keep it secure, keep it efficient, keep it uh, updatable, all that type of stuff. So yeah, I mean, you just, and you just took the word out of my mouth that time too. I mean, you've got the backbone that you want efficiency and you know bandwidth and everything, but the security piece. I mean, I, we've also seen that this has been you know, the fraudsters are smart people. They always go for the soft mm -hmm. underbelly. They've found all kinds of new places where they can yeah. poke and prod to figure out if they can get in and you know find a compromise. Well, if you've got all these different endpoints right now, you know, that's a, a wonderful way to do it. The, the, and the other thing that came up in the conversations, again, from a real estate standpoint is, you know, it's probably more a case that they're being kind of, I want to say dragged into it, but it's more that they have to get comfortable with it more than really enthusiastic about it. I'm talking about leadership moving into a remote workforce kind of setting that as the surveys come back, I think we see that there's an awful lot of work uh, people, employees who kind of like the setup. They yeah. claim a lot of their yeah. day back from the commute and whatnot. So it reminds me of a company that I was at at one point when you know everybody used Blackberries because they were more secure. And finally uh, the iPhone came out and some people said, too bad. I mean, so people who were senior enough who could get away with it said, I'm using an iPhone deal with it. And they had to figure out a way to make that work. And guess right. what? They did. Right. Yeah. Yeah. My, actually my brother-in-law was a high ranking guy in the Navy and he used to, you know, obviously used a Blackberry for years and years because of the security concerns. And now they're all using iPhones now. So yeah, it's yeah, amazing. different, uh, different topic for sure. I was, I'm always thinking about, uh, actually been thinking about this for the past three or four months is, is the collections wave that's coming that's it's kind of impending. Have you heard anything about that, Glenn? That you could that you could contribute, or anybody out there for with credit unions as well? Because I've I've wanted to have somebody on when I come in and substitute for John. One of my I'm going to hopefully have somebody in you know a, a collections expert come on and talk about collections. But I would really be interested in in hearing thoughts on how credit unions are kind of budgeting for the collections efforts that are gonna be coming around the corner here pretty soon, you know, in Q4 and then Q1 and Q2 of next year, that's when I hear it's really gonna kind of hit the fan, so to speak. So I'm interested to hear what you have, Glenn, if you have any information on that, Glenn, or anybody else out there, and if you don't wanna come on and talk about it, certainly shoot me, uh, you know, uh, a comment in the in the chat room or even a question or something like that. So, Glenn, I'm going to start with you. Have yeah, you I mean, I don't have mine is more speculation. I don't have any direct knowledge of that one. Andrew, you've kind of pointed out already the forbearance issue kind of makes it interesting because 
you know, it's it's the right thing to do. It you know is, is it serves our members well, and hopefully they're you know going to be able to pay. But you know that you still are left with the question that once a forbearance period is over, uh, is the person going to be back on their feet? So the delinquency, it's you know again, it's very difficult to apply traditional models to figure out where that's going to go. It's also, as I'm sure a lot of people on this call have seen, that the the trends in debit versus credit spend have been fascinating. You know, for a while there, you know, people actually shifted more to debit. The, the, mm -hmm. the amount of outstanding credit card debt in the country has dropped dramatically to like three and four year lows, which is not necessarily what you would have expected in this kind of a scenario. Mm -hmm. Now it looks like credit's coming back a little bit. And one theory, I forget, this may have been discussed even on, on one of these calls, I can't remember, that, you know, it may have been partially because of the, um, the uh, stimulus checks that suddenly if those things were automatically just kind of airlifted into your checking account, you had a higher balance. So you can do a couple. And I think it looks like people did both of these things. They either started using their debit card more because the money was there to pay for things, or they took that money and paid down their debt. Yeah. In a perfect world, I'd like to say it's because they were being extremely financially responsible and kind of getting <laughs> themselves ready. But historically, that's not necessarily you know, something we should assume that people are all doing things with quite that much forethought. Yeah, yeah. PSCU actually does a really good job of, of sending out a, kind of a weekly report. Like yes, I've seen Chuck Fagan stuff. usually. Yeah, so, that's, that's good stuff. Yeah, they really do. I'm sure there's a lot of other folks out there doing the same thing. But yeah, I get there you know, every week. I get you know, an update on what's... And I remember seeing, like you just said, the credit card spending was like way down. The debit was way up. I'm like, whoa, that's a change. So yeah, it was really interesting to see that. So And it's I, I think it's going to be interesting because we got a couple things going on now is... Uh, and it, it might help to prove it because if you see it twice, maybe that starts to look like a bit of a trend. If, I mean, all these different conversations about a second round of stimulus, I think all of them include another round of some type of direct deposit of a, you know, a balance to, mm -hmm. you know, to taxpayers, consumers, whatever you want to call them. So if you suddenly have that money sitting there again, how it's treated this time, it also will be very interesting to me that if that money shows up right around the holiday gift giving season. Exactly. Because we've got, I've seen statistics that say something like the average family spends about a thousand dollars on Christmas gifts. Mm -hmm. well, typically, that's not in your standard run rate. I remember the old days. I'm going to sound really old, but I remember the <laughs> concept of Christmas clubs, where you'd put away a little bit of money every month, and then you had the money to buy your Christmas gifts at the end of the year. I don't know a whole lot of people doing Christmas club savings anymore. Yeah. So <laughs> it becomes. I mean, I think the credit card basically winds up. Do, you just do it in in arrears. Because mm -hmm. you, you build up the balance and pay it off later. But it'll be interesting to see how people deal, especially if in any meaningful fashion, their income has actually been reduced, whether entirely or if they're a gig economy worker and it's just been taken down by X percent. And what that means about the way they approach their, their gift giving decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, the other uh, kind of a similar caveat on that is I've, I've heard that some people have said that August was when uh, the real recession really hit for a lot of people because of all the stimulus, all the, all the stimulus checks and all the, that kind of funding kind of ran out for those folks. And now they're really kind of, kind of, um, they're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place basically. So, um, so there's that other aspect of it as well. So, I mean, I mean it's, re it's really hard to parse. It's, I have a hard time with this because I mean, on one level, you know, you've got, the fact that the unemployment rate is, as they said, I think the highest it's been during an election cycle ever, potentially, if, if at least in the last like, you know, 7,500 years. But at the same time, it's down pretty significantly from the high point, yeah. you know, just a few months ago. Yeah. So you've got, you know, you've still got 90% of people who are employed. And if they're, you know, a lot of their typical discretionary spend, if they're not going out to eat as much, and if they're not going out to the movies and to mm -hmm. concerts and things, you know, arguably you've actually got a little bit of disposable income burning a hole in your pocket. But that really understates the impact on the people who are being hit. And I don't know, what, I, what I've never seen a good number on is given how we've shifted more and more toward the gig economy, the number of people who you know may not be quote unquote unemployed but have just taken a pretty significant haircut on the amount of money that they're bringing in yeah yeah no doubt i want to get to this other question here glenn based on your on your blog post a few weeks ago even though the crystal ball is quite murky for 2021 uh why is it no less important to tee up the questions and agree on a planning scenario 
within these within these meetings? Well, I mean, for part of it is what we've been discussing all along is to make sure that everybody is at least rowing in the same direction, right. because if, if you put those plans together, but I think it also is just valuable as a team to come together and say, okay, here's what we think is going to, and, and this, Andrew, maybe if you want to chime in again, in terms of, if you're willing to share any more about your strategic planning approach, you know, first you can come up with, here's what we're going to assume on a piece of paper for budgeting purposes. But we all know it's not going to happen exactly that way. So part of the conversation then can become, okay, you know, let's already start be thinking about, you know, if it's actually 15 degrees in this direction or 15 degrees in that direction, what are the next things we're going to do? It doesn't have to be literally baked to the level of budgeting, but having at least had those initial conversations so you're not suddenly starting from scratch again right. when things inevitably don't play out exactly as you prescribed. Yeah. And I think that's, again, more important than ever. No doubt, no doubt. And the significance, I mean, to be on the same page, especially now, again, I keep saying, I keep using the term uncertain because it's uncertain out there. <laughs> so, um, but to be on the same page and to be able to, I kind of go with the flow because I mean, it's, you got to be, it seems like you have to be really flexible this time around, because again, we don't know what's going to happen here, you know, much less next week or next year, next six months. So to be really flexible in these plans might be more important than ever is, do you get that? Uh, yeah. I mean, one example I can give, it's not budgeting per se, but when you think about public companies, I can't recall a time where I've seen more companies that just decline to give guidance for the coming quarter. At the end of, you know, when it comes to earnings season and people release or companies release their earnings, they typically say, and we expect to make X, uh, you know, earnings per share in the coming quarter. Right. And that gives the analysts a chance to figure out how they think if they, if they have credibility, which, you know, typically they, they have a sense of exactly how accurate they can assume that number is going to be. Mm -hmm. And there have always been a few companies that say, that's not our job. We don't know. We're not going to give you a number and then you're going to get mad at us if it's wrong. So you figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, usually, it, and it, it, there's a few companies that can get away with that, but historically, if you don't give guidance, the assumption is, oh boy, you've got a real problem on your hands and it's time to sell. This has been one of the first times I can remember where I've seen a fair number of companies who just say, we don't know. And so to me, it's a little bit like the budgeting process yeah. because I don't want to say that people have been forgiving about it. I mean, the market's holding up pretty well. It took a pretty big hit in the middle of the year, but I didn't see those companies being punished significantly worse than other companies because mm -hmm. I think a lot of folks, particularly in the financial services industry, understood that, you know, no, they, you need to have a fair amount of, you know, forward vision to be able to make those projections. And, you know, credit to them for being honest about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do we have any lessons learned from this experience that we could put into the budget planning process for 2020? I know this is kind of a question coming from left field and go Dodgers, by the way, because they won last <laughs> night. So, so I had to, I had to hey, you knocked my brains out. Come on. <laughs> I apologize. But are there any lessons learned so far that we could put into a, bu bu into a budget planning meeting? Um, I would probably... I mean, I don't know. Yeah. And whether it's literally a budget lesson, but more of an operational lesson, yeah, okay. I would say is the fact that we actually managed to keep the engine running yeah. in March, April, May. And again, I mentioned before, there was just this belief that you cannot do customer service for banks from home because there's too much personal information. You, 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 know, you can't have, you know, if you're dealing with somebody on financial matters, you can't have a dog or a kid barking, you know, barking or crying in the background. It's, and, and, and again, maybe if life had been going in its regular course of business, maybe people wouldn't have been as forgiving about those types of things. But I think everybody was kind of in the same boat and mm -hmm. therefore they were a little bit willing, you know, comfortable to be forgiving about those types of, you know, little kind of hiccups in the background. Yeah. So I think, you know, don't assume it can't be done. And as I said before, I think one of the lessons is it's be pretty comfortable with the idea that we're not going back to where we were. So it's probably a good idea. You know, don't just pretend that's going to happen and let's start treating some of this new environment as permanent to some extent and therefore make sure it's hardwired well enough that you can have it built to last. Right. And I, and I also keep thinking about a second wave of the virus coming mm -hmm. later this fall or this winter or early next year. 
I mean, is that something that, I mean, I apologize for my ignorance here. I, uh, I've never been in a credit union budget planning meeting before <laughs> or a strategic planning or meeting before. So, but is that something that is put into, uh, into the, 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 you know, the, the plans, so to speak? Is that the, you know, because it, it, it's interesting that you say, it, from a literal standpoint, I'd say no, but then I think this came up on one of these calls earlier too. Basically, what happened in March and April was effectively the whole, you know, contingency planning exercise that people are supposed to have a whole disaster recovery plan. In place. Right, right. You know, right. if a tornado blows away your headquarters or your, you know, the grid goes down and your, you know, your data center is shut down or something like that. We were pretty much at the equivalent of that because, it, you know, when, when else was anybody coming up with a scenario that said, by the way, none of your branches are going to open? figure out how to do your business, your branches aren't open. And that's about the only time you would have had to be dealing with something like that is if you were ripping open the envelope of your disaster recovery plan. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that I'd say it's literally planning for a second wave, but to the extent that people have reopened their branches, again, the comfort is that you now know it can be done, that you can shift back over. Yeah. But, you know, having that, you know, if you don't want it to be as much of a mad scramble, and it probably won't, because as soon as you've done it once, you can repeat it, but it'd still be better if you maybe institutionalize some of that memory a little bit to make mm -hmm. sure that you're ready if you have to pull that cord again. Yeah. Yeah. I actually heard an interesting, uh, interesting kind of anecdote from Brett Martinez from Redwood Credit Union. Mm -hmm. And I was on one of the many virtual conferences that we're all attending these days, but he was talking about, they just had you know, this, this horrible series of forest fires in mm -hmm. their, in their, in Northern California and Central California, the last like five years straight, it's been like this, but, uh, but he was commenting on that because of these fires, they've really had to up their ante in the business continuity area and the disaster recovery, that type of stuff. So when COVID came around last year or this past year, they were actually like really prepared for it. Yeah, so yeah, it was I like mean, it was like already in there. Talk about strategic plans. It was already there. They knew exactly what to do in kind of emergency situations. So I thought that was a really interesting take on it because I mean, what they've been through the last four, five, six years has been absolutely horrid and and just just a, a tragedy. So, but but it's also at the same time has prepared them for things like this. And they they really they, he said you know we didn't miss a beat. We were we knew exactly what to do. So that's another thing that's kind of in in these strategic plans, I would think as well. Yeah, and, and again, well, it depend, depends on you define your strategic plan versus your disaster recovery plan. Right. I'm remembering, you know, dealing with ATM machines in uh, New Orleans during Katrina. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, same kind of thing, Superstorm Sandy up in New York. So, you know, they, these do happen. They tend to happen on a very more isolated basis. And for the most part, you kind of know that it's only dealing with weeks of, rather than months mm -hmm. in terms for the, the real heavy impact. Yeah. Uh, well, this wasn't regional. This was national and global. And it's mm -hmm. been a lot more than a, a quick hit. Yeah. So it's, it's a little bit of a different story. Yeah. And at the same time, at the very end of his talk, he said, but you know what? Things have changed and we're never going back. Yeah. It's like what you said, it's like what you alluded to earlier in our conversation. We're never going back to what it was. You know, things have changed forever. And so that's something that I would think when you're in these strategic meetings, these budgetary meetings, we're never going back to those old ways. You know, things have to be revamped. Things have to be rethought. Things have to be, somebody, gosh, somebody else said, you know, kind of treat this as, treat this time as your credit union being a startup where you get to reevaluate everything. And really, kind of, uh, just kind of do a makeover, basically, on what you, what you can do. And it sounds like these strategic meetings, these budgetary meetings, are a great place to do that type of stuff to really rethink what's you know the priorities and all that type of stuff based on what's happened in the last six months. So, the other one that I think is going to be very interesting as you know we get through this is, you know. I doubt there have been a whole, well, actually, I shouldn't even say, I was going to say, I doubt there have been a whole lot of people who have been voluntarily leaving their jobs over the course of the last six months because they're very, very appreciative of security, but particularly yeah. to the extent that schools are closed. I mean, you are seeing statistics that show particularly women, just because of traditional roles, have been the ones that have been more inclined to leave the workforce yeah, to try to that. deal mm -hmm. with the, you know, the need of you know, homeschooling and whatnot. At some point, we're probably going to be looking at increased onboarding. I mean, at some point, there's just a natural flow in you know, the way that the churn works. People, I mean, that would be a good thing. I mean, if right. the economy is good enough that people are comfortable to leave their job and go to a new job, then you've got to hire somebody. Yep. 
if you're not back in the workplace. To me, that's when I think about things like this and having a, a conversation on Zoom. If you've already got a history with somebody and you've spent a ton of time in the office and you already know them and you've kind of got groups of people that know how they interact, I think Zoom is a lot easier to adapt to. If you've got somebody new who you've never sat you know, in the same office space with and haven't walked down the hall of the cafeteria and gotten to know them a little bit personally, and maybe this is just the old guy talking again, because I think that you know, younger folks are just more used to kind of building up these relationships on a virtual basis. But to me, that dynamic is, even if it can be done, we better figure out a good way to make sure it is done from an mm -hmm. onboarding standpoint. Because mm -hmm. to me, that's going to be another important thing. It may not be urgent in the next three months, but I think it will be in the 12 to 18 month range. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. All right. We have about 15 minutes left. And if anybody wants to chime in with any comments or questions, now's the time to do it. Again, we would love to hear from you. Just, I mean, obviously just come kind of from a sharing and caring standpoint, and it would really help out others out there who uh, may be stuck in some part of their budgetary planning or just their strategic planning for 2021, because we're all kind of, like you said, Glenn, and it's been said a million times, we're all in the same boat together. So uh, whatever's, whatever advice or information or, uh, or suggestions that you can provide would be greatly appreciated. And, uh, yeah, and not, not looking for negatives. I'm just oh, no. looking for perspectives on exactly you know, how you've tackled and you know, dealt with some of these issues. Because obviously, yeah. I'm sure these same conversations have been taking place. And I'm sure, again, based on, I haven't had to do it in a broad, multifunctional organization for a while, but you've always got, you know, somebody said, what do you expect me to do? I don't have any idea what it's going to look like in four <laughs> months. <laughs> I know we're all dealing with this unknown. So it'd be really cool to hear uh, what uh, some people, what some conversations have been like. It doesn't, you don't have to reveal any top secret specifics, but just kind of an overview. And if you don't want to come on, then just uh, shoot, uh, shoot something over in the chat as well. But having said that, while waiting for, oh, there's Tom. Tom O'Shea, how are you, sir? From Aspire, back on the Hello. East Coast. How are you, sir? Good, good. Um, I came in a little bit late. I had another meeting at three o'clock, but That's okay. uh, I wanted to touch on something Glenn was just speaking about. Um, was the family, the impact of the disaster on the family. Uh, we've done strategic planning over the years and all different types of scenarios. Um, and, and then we had a taste of this during Hurricane Sandy, whereas the one thing we didn't really consider was what was gonna happen to an employee's ability to work because of the impact on their family and their needs to take care of either children or elderly parents or, or even themselves. And so following Sandy, we factored that into our plans so that when we got to this point, we were, we were much better prepared. I mean, obviously it was still an issue, right. but, but it was something that you, you talk about, oh, we're just going to go back to work. Are you going to do X, Y, and Z? And, and you forget that bigger picture issue of, of that, you know, that household that they need to, to take care of and those mm -hmm. kids that you know, now they're homeschooling and they're in school, they're out of school. We're doing these hybrid models now and they're in one week and now another week. And that's us. Uh, it's yeah, us. yeah, us too. And uh, uh, it became a very important part of our planning following following Sandy, and it served us well. Can you share Here. a little bit without giving away anything proprietary of exactly how you did that? Was it an assumption that people would just not be available to the same extent, or was it a subsidy for childcare? How did you go about that? Oh, we just as we went and did subsequent tabletop exercises, we ha we just had that as one of our agenda items, and so all right, in this scenario because we do all different scenarios each year. Um, what is a probable outcome? What's the impact mm -hmm. on children and elderly? And, and then of course the family unit itself. So uh, yeah, we just looked at it as another dimension of the, of the DR planning and tabletop exercise, exercise process. Thank you. Yeah. And the only other comment I wanted to make was, you talked about we, um, you know, we can't go back to where we were. And my fear, and this is coming from talking to some credit union CEOs, is that my fear is that a lot of credit unions are just going to reopen their branches with, and basically expect business as usual. And it's right, it's not going to happen. And uh, they need to re-look re at their models and their service delivery. And you know, members have adapted. They've changed how they yeah. do banking and transactionally, especially. Yeah. Uh, so you've really got to look at that physical space and how you deploy it and how you now start to make it. Uh, make money for you and make it work for you. Yeah. But I, I think a lot are just going to re unlock, just going to go and unlock the door and hit the lights and. Scary. Oh, that's scary. 
I mean, are you guys, because, I mean, you guys were the hot spot there for a while, Tom, back in, I guess, what was it, April and May, that type of, do you guys have contingency plans uh, on board? Because, I mean, just in case a second wave comes around later this fall or this winter, that type of stuff? Well, I mean, we're obviously. We're operating as if there is, it, it's a continuous. It's a oh, continuous good for you. Okay. prior wave. Yeah, yeah. We haven't made any any plans to resume business locally. Uh, yeah, we're, we're just going to operate remote and, uh you're still in the same wave. Yeah, yeah, not, not <laughs> second. Second. No, I, have, I have no plans to make any changes at this okay. stage. And how, how, the, how have the members reacted to that? Are they fully understanding? Is that enough of a kind of a standard approach that they don't wonder why? Are you are you an outlier from that standpoint? It's been it's been pretty good with our members. Uh, we've been more of a digital delivery in the first place, so that we weren't branch dependent. Um, the only issue that we are our weakest link in our model, and and we sort of compensate for it with shared branching is cash. If so, if someone receives cash, we have to identify deposit taking ATMs. And there seem to be enough of them around to get members to go to them, but that's been the, that's been the weakest link. But otherwise, uh, you know, the delivery has been, uh, it's been consistent across the board for us. It's been good. The one place that I could picture the biggest change from the branch uh, standpoint is small support of small business to the extent that you've got small businesses as one of your customers, they're coming in and, you know, they've been equivalently disrupted. So, you know, at this stage of the game, that probably isn't a big, I don't know if, if there's going to be symmetry in terms of the recovery path, but, you know, what they may be looking to the branch to do for them, you know, and the, the good news is if you're listening to your customers, that will probably become clear enough as opposed to in some other cases where you say you just open the door, assume things are going to go back to normal and you may not know that people are just going to wind up going in other directions. I suspect the small businesses will let you know what they need, I would hope. Yeah, that's not one of our primary lines of business, so we don't have a lot of experience right. with that, but um, I can imagine their biggest complaint is coins. Yeah, <laughs> that too. <laughs> Getting coins for the till. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, thanks, Tom. Thanks for, uh, thanks for uh, participating and, and providing some important information. We appreciate that, sir, as we do every week. So, and happy you guys are doing, you guys are all happy, healthy, and safe on the East Coast. Yep. Okay. Yes, yes, so far, so good. Yeah. Good deal. All right. Well, we'll keep it that way. All right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Stay home. <laughs> That's right. Glenn, any, you want to give us some takeaways from today's talk, uh, Glenn? Because we only have like maybe nine or 10 minutes left. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Tom kind of laid it out pretty nicely there as well. We're not going all the way back, as we've said before. I do think that there will be, you know, a bit of a reversion to, you know, some old habits and patterns, but not all the way back. And, you know, we've all known, you know, you know with, with some obvious exceptions, nobody expected all the branches to close and things like that. But a lot of what has transpired from a banking standpoint because of COVID is like is largely things that we kind of knew were in process already. Um, they just happened a whole lot faster. So if people were already proactive, it probably was a little bit easier to adapt. Yep. And yep. for the folks who do need to adapt, well, guess what? You were going to have to anyway. This mm -hmm. just kind of forced the issue. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, when you get back to the operating assumptions, that's why I would really double down on those types of areas because, you know, one of those weird kind of, you know, business speak kind of things. It's a no regrets move. It, it, it's very hard to imagine by investing more in digital, you're going to go, oh, turned out we didn't need to do that. I, I think it's <laughs> yeah. pretty safe to assume that regardless of how COVID plays out, you're still going to need to be investing in digital. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. I'm, and, and I keep talk, I talk to a lot of fintechs as you, as, as well as you do, Glenn, but the innovations that are, that are percolating from what's taken place the last seven, eight months are tremendous already. I can't imagine what's, or I, hopefully I can't imagine what's going to be coming around the corner here in the next six months to 12 months. So it's actually really exciting. And I hope credit unions are kind of planning for that as well. What's, what's on the horizon based on what's happened and how we've evolved in, in our businesses these days. So it's, well, and it's interesting you say that because I didn't touch on this, but you know, one of my favorite conferences, which like all the other ones have gone digital now is Finnovate where you get to yeah. see a lot of these new solutions. Yeah. And uh, they did their digital version of what is normally, it was pretty much right on their usual schedule, the East Coast, New York one that usually takes place in September. So they did that uh, in late September. And I always try to really kind of look at the themes of what I see as kind of the clusters of, of new opportunities. 
Um, and it really kind of mapped to, you know, what we're talking about right now. There was a company that very specifically was applying artificial intelligence to collections. Mm -hmm. Not something I'd be too excited about normally. And I hate to think that that's like the growth industry, but it's definitely it something we have to be looking at. Yeah. Um, another CUSO that I think won at uh, Venture Tech last year called Illuma Labs. Have you spoken yeah. to them before? I've heard of it. Not yet, but I've heard, okay. I know of them. Yes. They, they presented as well. And I, I liked, again, as we talked about, as people work more digitally, you've got that concern about security. And you've got this you know, notion that you know, if you can provide you know, voice authentication, they do it in such a way that, you know, I know the last time I had to do something like that, I had to recite a script so that if someone then wanted me to confirm my voice, I had to then say those exact oh, really? words. So they okay. could, these people, according to their solution, at least what they say is that you don't need to do that. They what? will just capture your voice print. They'll just ask and make sure that you're comfortable with them doing it. And then in a subsequent phone call, when you call in, they can authenticate you without you having to recite specific hmm. words. So it provides you know, peace of mind for both the institution and the, the member. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't require anything that's sticky that requires you to kind of go offline to actually execute, either to set it up mm -hmm. or to, you know, go off path from where the reason the person had called in the first place. Yeah. So those are the kind of solutions that I'm seeing that yeah. I think could be more interesting. Normally, they do their West Coast version in the spring. Well, they've pushed it out. It's actually happening Thanksgiving week. So we'll see some more solutions then. I'll be curious again to see how they line up against, like you said, a couple others that were very small business focused, cash flow projections. Again, a very important thing. So much of a lot of the you know, kind of recent stuff around small business have been around PPP management. Mm -hmm. um, and that isn't going away soon either. The whole forgiveness process and monitoring process of those loans, people are trying to take the pain out of that. So that's kind of a a short-term, you know, solution, but, mm -hmm. you know, more broadly, I think small businesses, it, it, and again, it's one that I think was always out there to be addressed. And this just kind of forced the issue. Good stuff. Good stuff, sir. And if you guys want to see more of Adluma, actually Adluma Lambs, they're going to, they're one of the final four contestants on Nacuso's next big idea next week. I think it's the 27th. If you want to go to Nacuso's website and, and check that out, uh, they're pretty cool. So they're, and they're doing the final four of their next big idea contest next week. And Edwin Malams is one of the final four contestants. So if you want to check them out a little closely, go, go check them out there. So thanks for bringing that up. Glenn. Appreciate yeah. It. They, they really stood out for me. If anybody, I like that. That sounds like really cool. All right. Guys. All right. Uh, we've got about four minutes left, three minutes left. I know you have a hard stop Glenn. So uh, I just want to say a big thanks for you taking an hour out of your day to chat with us about a very timely topic and uh, everyone who chimed in, Tom and Andrew and the rest, thank you very much, guys, for, uh, for participating and, and giving us uh, your perspective. It's always, I love the credit union perspective because that really makes, it, really makes it real for us. So we appreciate that. And uh, any, any final words, Glenn? Anything else to wrap up? No, I just always love to follow up on these conversations. So if anybody, I, I, you probably know where to find me, but uh, you know, my name at 154advisors.com and uh, you know, love to have a conversation. Good deal. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it, everybody. And we will see you all in seven days. And Melissa, thank you very much for, uh, for doing all the behind the scenes work. Thank you. very. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. You're welcome. All right, guys. We'll see you in seven days. Thanks, Thanks. Tom. See you.